Friday, Friday. Okay. So I don't know the time yet, but uh, we'll, we'll send you that information by email soon. Um, also, I, I mentioned this last week, but I am doing some traveling. So if you want to meet with me, today is a good day. Um, and I'll be around basically till the end of the day, as long as you need. Yeah. That was my next question. Okay, so has the registrar emailed you your exam soft information? <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I'll I'll get with him and I'll ask about that today. Um, I emailed them last week and they assured me it would be soon, um, but I will I will be on top of it. Um, so thank you for your reminder. Um, and if for whatever reason you don't hear anything by say Thursday, email me again, please, because they don't tell me when they email you, so I have to rely on you for uh, for the for this knowledge. What else? Uh, but anyway, so in terms of the midterm, I went over it last week. I explained the details, but please make sure you try your best and do as hard as you can. I realize it's early in the semester. Again, this is deliberate. You haven't learned that much, which is deliberate. And hopefully that will allow you to focus more on thinking about the facts. Uh, we haven't covered that much, right? We've done basically four classes of hunting animals uh, and a few other topics. So there's not that much to learn, but I want to see how you're able to um, uh, acclimate the material. And let me make a note to myself to email the registrar. That way, you don't panic without the uh, without the. Um, okay. All right. So, any questions on our topic from last week? Any topics on question in your body? Any questions on topics in your persona? Anything about that? Yes, ma'am. Hold on. That's uh, that's normal. Yeah. I'm trying to get your names. I'll, I'll get them eventually. No um, so I was watching your video and somebody mentioned um, about selling your hair. And you, selling your hair, yes. And you stated that, you know, it grows back, but yeah. you, know, you can sell it, so, you know, there's no invasive right. you know, process. But what about the DNA that's in your hair? Like, if somebody, I mean, is there like, you sell your hair and then somebody uses it to test, you know, other stuff? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you're saying when you sell your hair, can you say I'm only selling it to make a wig yeah, versus I'm selling it to make a DNA research? Well, even, even if you sell it, like, you know, I cut my hair and I gave it to um, MD Anderson. Right. You know, for, for them to make some money. What if they use it for research that I don't know? Ah, so this is actually a bundle of six question, right? When you give away your hair, mm -hmm. you can determine those uses which will be used for. So you can say this is only used for a wig and no scientific research. Or I'll give you another example, one from a case we're studying from, uh, for today. If you sell the oil and gas rights underneath your property, right, and they find a boat buried in the dirt under your property, do they acquire a right to the boat? Yeah. No. Because no. all you gave them was the oil and gas rights, right? If you only give someone a lease for oil and gas, for example, to dig for oil and gas, whatever's underneath, and they discover this boat, a boat is not oil. Right? So you can actually specify with property law the exact use that you allow someone to make of your property. Does that make so, sense? So as in another, so as in another case that we had previously, if we come and we do, we donate our hair and we find that it was for research, we can have a cause of action with it? Yeah, as, assuming, assuming when they, they cut off your hair, you had something signed and notarized that explained the terms that it should be used, and yes. Yeah. Yes, good question. Yeah, you can always control how your property is being used. The problem in the Moore case was that they lied, right? They said, we'll use it for this purpose, and they use it for some other purpose. But in that case, the cause of action was a breach of the, uh, uh, breach of the fiduciary trust. It wasn't the actual conversion of the cells. Other questions on last week's class with the organs, with Vanna White, anything? <clears throat> okay, so our topic for today um, sounds simple, but it's not, right? The readings for today were actually fairly short. You just count the number of pages, but the Hannah case was surprisingly, annoyingly complex. And for whatever reason, every year it gives students trouble, so we'll go through it really slowly. Um, the concept of finders keepers is one that you know every kid when they're little, you know, finders keepers, losers weepers, right? We all we all said that a hundred times when we we're kids. But as we'll discuss, the case law on this topic is very, very um, inconsistent. It started off really simple with the first case, and they kept adding one test after another test after another test 
till you got to the end, you're saying, "Oh man, what the heck's the rule of law?" And and that's that's one of the frustrations of this of this class in particular, uh, because this area is so disjointed. When they start making you read English cases, you know you're in trouble. Um, it's it's true. Um, so before we get too far into the weeds, I want to introduce a concept built on a bundle of sticks. And the concept I said last week was, you can have one piece of property, right? And you get several people who lay claims to it. So let's say I own a house and I lease it to him, right? Who owns it? Well, it's actually a complicated question, right? I have an ownership interest and he has an ownership interest, right? For this period of one year, he has a lease and he's allowed to use exclusively. I can't randomly walk in on his house while he's leasing it. I can't control you know, who comes and goes from his property. I have very limited rights, but after that one year is up, it reverts back to me in full. So the question that you have to think about is not just who owns something, but when do they own it, right? Priority, right? He has it for this year, and then my, my priority comes in next. I get it back next year. If you start to think of property in this fashion, it makes a lot more sense. Because property is not at one point in time. It's over a period of time. I own it today. He owns it tomorrow. And then next year, someone else signs a lease and they own it then. Okay? Try to keep this in mind. Because it will make the finder's keeper topic a lot simpler. For example, the jewel in the first case. Who owned it? Well, originally, this person owned it. And this person found it. And then they gave it to the jeweler. And the jeweler had it. What happens if the original owner came back? Well, then that person has it, right? There's a, there's a temporal component to property that will make a lot more sense. And I want to show you a video uh, of, the, of the Barry Bonds issue. Um, it's just discussed all the way to the very end. I think I page on, but it's towards the end of your notes. It's the case of um, Papa versus Hayashi. Um, did anyone ever hear of this case before, the Barry Bonds ball? Anyone know about this? Right, so, so for those of you who don't know, Barry Bonds was a, was a San Francisco giant, a very famous player. He's come into some um, uh, disrepute because of his uh, steroid use. But at the time, he was one of the greatest sluggers in the game. He was about to set the record for uh, uh, the most home runs. So if you think about it, the issue of a baseball player hitting a ball into the stands, there's a lot of changes in the ownership of property. Okay? And I, wa I want you to watch this video. Uh, it's short. It's two minutes. Uh, uh, and, and this will give you a sense of how this works. Here's the payoff. Up the bonds. And he hits it high. Oh! It's coming right at me. Oh, my God. It's like heading right for me. Patrick Hayashi of Santa Clara County comes up with a jewel out in the right field bleachers. Patrick is going to be the Bay Area's newest millionaire. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. He's not the guy who caught the ball. Oh. I go up. I'm, I'm probably six inches taller than anybody around me. I catch it. <laughs> then we start to realize that this is actually a bigger story than just this historic home run ball. There is a fight now brewing over the record-setting 73rd home run ball. At that point, Alex hired an attorney, and he filed a lawsuit against Patrick Hayashi. You guys got a better chance splitting the money than going to court. I will be the right foot owner of that ball at the end of this trial. You have no witnesses. You have no videotape. <laughs> An umpire has to make a decision in less than a second. Now we have that decision stretched out over weeks and weeks and weeks in a courtroom. I saw Mr. Hayashi bite a kid. Do you recall yelling out, ouch? Yes. Okay. I think it was Al. Sorry. I say it's finders, keepers, losers, weepers, man. Give the man back a damn ball. Just move on. That falls off the branch. The Giants are happy for you to keep any ball thrown or hit into the stands. However, this can be dangerous. So please be alert at all times. Okay, very good. All right, so the, the, the facts, is, I mean, this is actually a, this is actually a case, and property detectives <coughs> Used to, they don't anymore. But these actually include this as a, as a reported case. So the facts of the case were like this. So um, uh, let's just start going around the room. So uh, where did I finish last time? Oh, thank you. Okay, that okay. Uh, that's 
How do you pronounce your name? Cece. Okay, I can do that. Cece. <laughs> Thank you. Cece. Okay, so let, let's walk through this step one moment at a time, right? So when the pitcher throws the ball, right? When the ball is in his hands, right? Who owns that ball, broadly speaking? And who does he work for? Baseball, right? Yeah, okay. I'm going to just see anything. So the moment the ball leaves his hand, right, it belongs to Major League Baseball. Okay, then the guy hits with his bat. So you see, what happens the moment the ball shoots off the bat and flies into the sky? Who actually owns it at that point? Well, this, well, the ball's flying. I mean, you heard, you heard what the announcement was at the end, right? They said, you know, players, uh, fans are allowed to keep any balls hit into the stands, right? So the second the ball leaves the bat of Barry Bonds, who actually – is there any owner of the ball out hurling through the air? Okay, I think that's right. Okay, as the ball is flying through the air, uh, it's ownerless because effectively, think about it, Barry Bonds and Major League Baseball abandoned it. They abandoned it. That's if they threw it away, Right. Had they wanted to keep the ball, they could have kept it in the field to play, but Barry Bonds slammed it out to the outfield. Okay, so the video was kind of hard to watch. But, but as it were, Papa, the guy wearing the Giants jersey, had his glove up, and he caught it. But the second it went to his glove, he got rushed. Okay, you had all these people basically jumping at him and plowing on him, and the ball popped out. Okay. It's unclear how, but the ball actually hit the ground. It was kicked, tackled, grabbed. I mean, there was, there was a massive scrum. And this was, this was before iPhones. So this, is, you know, this happened today. We had 15 cameras on, on, the, on the scene. So you don't have a very good uh, advantage point. Hayashi got down to the ground, apparently bit someone. Um, <laughs> unclear. And he ripped. The, you know, the ball off the ground. And then there's that picture of him holding it like this, right? You saw, you saw that picture. He's, he's hold, I think I have it somewhere. Uh, I think of the picture somewhere over here. Yeah, so there's that picture. He had it in his glove, but then Hayashi was able to pick it off the ground. So then the question was, how do you resolve this issue? So believe it or not, lawyers were involved, right? This, this was a ball at the time that was worth a million dollars. So what's actually funny in hindsight, let me mention this point first. Ultimately, the, the, okay, so the estimate for the ball was one and a half million dollars, right? That was the estimate given to it. Ultimately, he's only sold for four hundred fifty thousand dollars. The reason why, and if you're a baseball fan, you'll know this, is that in, in the years after Bonds hit this ball, he became very unpopular. He was tied up in the steroid scandal. Um, you know, <laughs> the value of a Barry Bonds baseball dropped a lot. And actually, to make it even worse, the guy who bought it was a guy named Mark Echo, who was a fashion guy, and he actually bought it. Yeah, what's that? What did he do? He, he he branded an asterisk into the ball because you know if there's a record with an asterisk it wasn't well deserved so he basically branded the ball and then the hall of fame and cooperstown wouldn't take it because it was basically a uh <laughs> it, it, was, it was a destroyed relic it was embarrassing so fun, funny how that all how that all worked out so what happened was the judge in this case was so the judge in san francisco said i got an idea let me go call some law professors to figure this out which is, is the second mistake they made after bringing the suit and then you know Believe it or not, the court opinion analogizes this to Pearson v. Post. For real, yeah. They analogize to Pearson v. Post. Um, okay, is that uh, Alua Alu Kemi? Kemi. Kemi, okay, I can do that too. Kemi, what, what, did the, what did the law professor say? I mean, how did the court, you know, understand who got there first? It, it's, only a small, it's only a small thing at the very end, but how did the courts get to this? You got it? How do you think they resolved it? Kevin, right here. Based on what we studied the first couple weeks of class, how do you think they, how do you think they would resolve this case? You're a law, a law student, including law professors. How do you think how do you think the law professors would suggest this case ought to be resolved? Who gained possession of the ball? Who has the stronger claim to the ball? Who has it last? Where do you so why do you think who has it last? Okay, so we have this picture, right? This, this, is, this is Popov, right, the first guy. He caught it. 
it was in his glove. But then he got tackled, and I mean, people are jumping over, <laughs> and then it popped out of his glove. And this other guy scrambles on the floor and picks it up. So, Kenny, who who among those two people has a strong claim? The guy who had hit his glove, or the guy who managed to just pick it up after the scramble? Okay. Oh, okay, okay. Let's see. Um, is that Jimmy? Jimmy. Who has a stronger claim here? The guy who actually caught it first or the guy who came away with it? What do you think? Why do you think he – why do you think the guy who came away with it is a stronger claim? Uh, because, well, there's no established possession. Ah, so, okay, so so let me let me ask you like this, right? Let's put this in terms of hunting. It hit his guy's glove and then it fell out. What would the analogy be, say, if you're hunting an animal, right? Use the analogy. But you capture it? Yeah, so imagine this. So let's make it easier. No guns, right? Let's say that you're chasing the fox, right? Let's say you're chasing the fox, and, like, you dive and you tackle, and you get the fox by its tail, and the fox's tail's in your hand, and it pulls away. Have you caught the fox? Right. And under Pearson v. Post, right, if you just – touched the fox and it slipped away, that may not have even been enough to establish possession. So, I mean, under the Pearson rule, the rule of capture, which we think of as really finders keepers, right? Under the rule of capture, he didn't actually get it. I mean, it, it was literally in his glove for a split second and it fell out. To, to use the, you know, to, <laughs> to use an NFL, NFL expression, he did not maintain possession on his way down, right? I mean, if you ever watch the instant replays, <laughs> It was in his hands, and as he was coming down, he was bobbling it, right? Didn't have possession. So what happened ultimately? The court said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who has a superior claim. So I'm going to order a sale of the ball, and we'll divide the price in half. Okay, so the judge had no idea. So if this is hard for law students, judges also have no idea. So what happened? The judge uh, said order a sale. The ball sold for $450,000. Mr. Popov racked up legal fees of $473,000. And remember, what did I say? The first rule of lawyering. What's the first rule of lawyering? Get paid. So you know how we got paid? The we'll say it out loud? The second the ball sold, he put a hold on the payment saying, I haven't been paid yet. So of all the money that Popov got, it went to his freaking lawyer. <laughs> He, he made off very poorly. He did not make off well. That's why I said the mistake was he hired a lawyer. He should have just split it with Hayashi and been dumped. Barry Bonds was right. Barry Bonds said split it, right? He was, he was right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I mean, that's actually, that's actually an issue, though, because imagine you're just a random guy, right, making whatever income, and this million-dollar ball pops into your hand. You now have to pay a massive amount of taxes before you sell it. Because if you don't sell it immediately, your tax bills do that year. And the second you have that ball in your possession, it's as if you gained a million dollars in income. So you probably paid taxes on the million dollar value, even though only sold several years later for a quarter million or four four fifty. So he, this guy got, I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, I think Derek Jeter it was his three thousand hit or something, it was a home run, I think, right? And then the guy gave it back to him, was like, that was a smart move. Just be cool. Yeah, yeah. Go for it. Couldn't you just claim the value of a normal baseball and then sell it and then have your taxes after that? No, the IRS is not that stupid. I mean, <laughs> the IRS say like this is Gary Bond's four hundred, you know, seventy third baseball. For they're 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 collectors who make these predictions. I mean, in this case, one of the issues for damages was they predict what the value of ball was. I mean, there's experts who testify based on you know. What Mark McGuire's home run was worth a number of years ago. I mean, there's, there's ways of estimating this. And the estimators, like, also have to come from the IRS, so have to Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, so if, if there's ever a ball curling towards you, don't catch it. You'll be worse off. <laughs> It'll make your life miserable. It sounds awesome. Or just give it to Barry Bonds. Donate to Cooper's Town and be done with it. Uh, uh, you'll get a nice plaque. You'll get a hat, probably, but you know. Okay. All right. Any questions on that? I mean, it's, it's an easy enough case, but it, it illustrates the point that finders keepers isn't, isn't always so easy to apply. So let's talk about the first case. Um, 
is that, is that, is that Jesus? Yeah. Jesus, tell me please, what were the facts in Armory versus uh, Delamory? This is probably the shortest case you'll ever read, and uh, uh, at least at least a short case in this term. What's it, what were the facts in Armory versus Delamory? Uh, chimney sweeps. Everyone see Mary Poppins, right? The uh, okay. so the actual chimney sweeps were not as tall as Dick Van Dyke. They were actually children, and the reason why chimney sweeps were children was because the chimneys were very small. They were on average nine inch by fourteen inch, so basically like a <laughs> foot across, you know, three quarters of a foot. So effectively, what they would do um, is they would get small children. If you notice, he's not wearing any shoes or anything. And they would have these hats, these stovepipe hats, and these little brushes. And what they would actually do is shimmy up the chimney with this little brush to dislodge all of the soot. Um, very often, if the, if the flute, the chimney was too small, they would actually have to take all of their clothes off so they wouldn't get stuck. Now, the reason why this profession was very, very dangerous <coughs> is that very often children would get stuck in there. And this is an image, uh, it's, it's hard to see, but you see they actually crawl up, 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 up through these little turns, and they come out the top, and they have to slide down. But what would often happen is they would shimmy up the pipe, and then if their knees get too close to their chests, they get stuck. Um, and the only way to get them out is to basically yank them from below or push them from above, which was not always feasible. So very often they would actually asphyxiate and suffocate. And then they'd have to remove the bricks to clear out the chimney um, and remove the body. So this was a very um, dangerous, dangerous profession. And that's why Dick Van Dyke would have never gotten within six inches because he was too tall. Um, this practice w w was basically made uh, illegal, Parliament banned in 1875, and thank God to technology, machines were able to replace this horrible, horrible function and to take the role of cleaning out the flutes. Um, but you can imagine in the year 1722, when this case came to the King's Bench, the King's Bench was like the highest court in England, uh, you know, effectively their Supreme Court. Um, uh, this, was a, this was an interesting case. Now, Jesus, let me ask you one more question. How do you think it is that this boy, Armory, managed to bring a case, this poor chimney sweep, right? Managed to bring a case all the way up to the highest court in England. How do you think that happened? Do you think he did it by himself? <clears throat> Who do you think helped him? <coughs> you, think, you think people, you think he had parents that could afford this? Ah, so. What's interesting about this case is how could this poor chimney sweep, right, Chim Chim Cherie, how could he afford to litigate this case all the way up? We don't know. But if I had to speculate, there are some probably uh, benevolent groups who are trying to help the plight of, uh, of these chimney sweeps, and they had an interest in this case. And one other thing that makes me think that, um, is that George? Yes. George, let me ask you a question. How did, how did Armory find this uh, jewel? Do we know where he found it? Uh, it didn't stay in there. I'm, I'm assuming that. Stole it. Thank you. I'm glad you're honest. Yes, he stole it, right? <laughs> There's almost no doubt in my mind that he stole this, right? He was probably doing a sweeping of some 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 wealthy person's house, saw this jewel on the table, like, okay, look, I'm making you know pennies crawling up this thing. <laughs> Let me steal this, bring it to a pawn shop, bring it to a jeweler, and I'll get the money off it, right? Now, there was no secret that he stole it. Now I'll ask a follow-up question. Why do you think the original owner never made a claim to it? I mean, this is public news. It's like a big case. Don't you think they could have figured out who the jewel it was based on where he was sleeping that day? Yeah, I guess. I guess because. I guess because probably everyone felt so bad for the kid. Yeah. So if I had to guess, right, the owner of the home felt bad for him, didn't want to return the jewel, and people were trying to help this guy out. But that's important. That fact's important, Matthew. Why is it important that the actual, the, the original owner, the, the, the wealthy homeowner, didn't make a claim to the jewel? Why is that relevant? Exactly, right? The major rule of this case is that in all instances, the original owner, 
the first owner has a superior claim. The original owner has a superior claim. That's why this is relevant. At any point, the person whose house he robbed could have come back and said, hey, that's my jewel. And this case was appealed all the way up to the king's bench, the highest court. So that, that, I mean, I have no knowledge, but that leads me to believe, or leads me to, 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 to suggest that they, they, they were okay with him having this, and that's actually, um, that's actually relevant. So, so in any event, we don't have the original owner, right? The original owner is nowhere in the picture. We don't know who this person is. So then the claims becomes, which of the two criminals has a stronger right to the jewel? Why did I say it like that, right? Is that um, the James? Yes. James, why did I just say that? Which of the two criminals has a stronger right to the jewel? Why, why did I frame the issue like that? Uh, well, how did, how did Armory come into contact with the jewel? What did, uh, what did he just say a minute ago? He stole it. Yeah, he stole it. He's a criminal, right? right. If, if I go to your house and they steal your jewelry, what happens to me? But I just say, shoot me, right? But yes, you, I go to jail. Exactly right. You could shoot me if you like. So <laughs> I won't steal your stuff. How did the jeweler come into contact with the, with the item? Uh, and what did what did the jeweler do? And what do we call that when you take something from someone? That's hang that. Yeah, he stole it. Say it, yeah. So we have two criminals here, right? Armory stole it from the house. <laughs> And then the jeweler, the Laramie, stole it from the sweep. So we have two criminals. And I'm, I'm guessing if you were the jeweler, right, you're like, oh, who is this little kid? We can just take this from him, give him a couple pennies, right, whatever. We don't have to worry about him. We can take advantage of him. Who, who's going to believe this kid who just stole this jewel over us? Yeah? So uh, is that Kaylee? So, Kaylee, how do we resolve this dispute then between two criminals? We have one criminal who stole it first, and then we have a second criminal who stole it from the sweep. How do we resolve this dispute? <laughs> I'm sorry? Whoever stole it first. I like that, right? Why is it, was it finders, keepers, stealers, weepers? I mean, why, why is it whoever stole it first, Kaylee? Right, but he came into contact with it. Did he, did he buy it? Right? Okay, so let's, let's make this a little bit nicer to this group. Let's say finder one and finder two. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll become yeah, more charitable, right? We'll call it finder one and finder two, okay? And you said finder one is a sweep and finder two is a jeweler, right? Is that right, Kaylee? Okay, so why does finder one have a stronger claim to the, to the jewel. Okay, it came to possession first. So really there are three parties here, and I'll expand on Kaylee's moment, right? There's the original owner, finder one, and then there's finder two. The original owner, we don't know where this person is. They're, they're, they're missing. But we know that the original owner has the strongest claim. Okay? Sorry, the original owner has the strongest claim, without a doubt. At any point, the original owner can show up and say, ah, ah, that's mine. Give it back. But now we have a conflict, right? We have finder one and finder two. And so, Anna, I just repeated again, but how do we know which of these two has a certain claim, finder one or finder two? <clears throat> okay, good. So what the court here basically says is this finder's keepers, right? Always, the original owner has the strongest claim, and don't forget that part. But as between finder one and finder two, one has a stronger claim. Again, this is what I said at the outset of class. It's not just who owns it, but what the priority is, right? With the owner, original, strongest. But between one and two, one wins. So even though in the case of uh, uh, Armory versus Delarmy, whatever it is, right, <laughs> one wins, had the original owner showed up at any time, he or she would get it. As the court says, the sweep can keep it, 
quote, against all but the rightful owner. So basically, the sweep has a stronger claim against everyone except for the original owner. Yes, uh, 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 JL. So what if the owner passed away and could be a state? Yeah, the owner's estate inherits the owner's interest. No problem there. Even if it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. At what point would the court say that the owner abandoned? Oh, good question. So there's a doctrine you'll learn next semester called adverse possession. And adverse possession is what's often known as squatting. What does that mean? Say you let someone take a piece of your property and you do nothing about it for 10 years. Ownership actually transfers to the thief. You'll do a case next semester in property two where someone um, stole a painting from George O'Keefe. And this person had the painting in their possession for nearly 40 years. And the question in that case was whether basically O'Keefe relinquished any right to claim that painting. I won't, I won't spoil it, right? But the long answer is you can actually lose a claim to the thief over, over that many years. You'll, you'll do this next semester, right? but it's a, it's a good point to raise. Okay? So everyone get the rule, right? The sweep wins against everyone except for the world. I'm sorry, except for the original owner. Okay? So what's interesting then is the measure of damages. I mean, this isn't really relevant to the class, but as you recall, the jeweler basically took out the jewel and gave him back the socket, right? The, you know, the, 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 the casing of, of the jewel. And the jeweler refused to say how much is even worse. So what did the court say? We will assume it's a jewel of the finest water, right? So in other words, the most pure stone that could be, that is the measure of damages. So of course the court knows that won't happen. The jeweler will miraculously find the jewel, hand it over, and give the value under this action of Trover for the damages. Note the boy doesn't want a, a, a replevin. The boy doesn't want the actual return of the jewel. He wants a value because he's a poor chimney sweep. Uh, this must have been a very valuable jewel as well that someone was paying his legal fees. And I suspect they may have gotten a cut of it, in addition to their benevolence to the, to the poor, poor boy. Yeah, yeah, is that uh, Cody? Yeah. I like that the court said that if they're unwilling to give the jewels back, we're going to just assume that it's the most expensive jewels that we can find. You like that? Why do you like that? I think it was very just <laughs> to, to, to give the benefit of the doubt to even though he is possibly a thief. Well, well, no, but but that's the point I want to stress. With this finder's keeper doctrine, just because you're a thief doesn't mean you're the bad guy. Because you have a thief and you have thief number two, right? And thief number two is actually worse than thief number one. So actually, the mere yeah, the mere fact that you're a thief doesn't make it bad. Yeah, Norma. <laughs> It was actually on private property, right? Oh. Why did the court raise that? Because you're jumping ahead to something that hasn't happened yet, right? The cases are laid out and the sequence are laid out to illustrate how this doctrine developed. So this case, I think, 1722. The other case you mentioned was 18-something, right? They came later. So actual, in this class, will trace the development of the doctrine. But at this point, they hadn't made any difference between it. Now, let me ask you a question. Had the jewel been found in someone's private property, right? What would the correct thing for the boy to have been done? Yeah, but he stole it from the owner, so he's not yeah. going to do that, right? So yeah, but, but you're exactly right. It, this this uh, developed later on. So let's just go to an example. It's on page 126, please. Um, at, at, the very, at the very bottom, note one. Okay. Uh, what was I up to? Um, uh, Christian, please. Okay, so th there's a uh, there's a there's a there's a problem at the in this first paragraph. So it says, okay, so let's test it, right? F1 loses a watch it earlier found. Okay, you see what I'm reading? Okay, so F1 loses a watch it earlier found, and it's later found by F2. F1 sues for return of the watch. Who wins? <laughs> yeah, but tell me why. That you know, that's easy. Now tell me why though. I knew the answer was there. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. Why? No, 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 no. Here. Why? No, I feel like it's it's just reiterating what you just said. F1 on first. Good. Yeah. So that one's straightforward. So let me give you a different example, right? So let's say you have 
uh, you have the original owner, you have F1, okay, and you have F2. So F1 finds it, okay, and then F2 steals it from F1, okay, and to make it even harder, F3 steals it from F2. Okay, you're with me. All right, Ash, let's walk through this one at a time, okay? You have the case of F2 versus F3, okay? You have the case of F2 versus F3. Who wins that case? Why does F2 win? That's right. Exactly right. Earlier in time, okay? Let's try this one. Um, uh, is, is that, uh, hold on, is that Jordan? Jordan, so F1 sues F3, who wins? Why? I, I know this is simple, I'm doing this deliberately to make sure you guys get it, okay? Okay, and then just to make it easier, F1 sues F2, uh, 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 Caitlin, who wins? Yeah, that's right, F1. So in case you didn't get this, right, F1 wins against everyone. F2 only wins against F3. But if the original owner shows up, the original owner has the strongest claim among all of them. So this is a situation where we have three thieves. <coughs> but each thief has a different priority in the pecking order of a stronger claim. Yes, ma'am? Oh, that's, hold on. That's, a, uh, that's uh, Jessica? Yes. Jessica, thank you. Um, F3 buys it from F2. Does it matter if they buy it or steal it? Um, ah. It shouldn't because he actually has not acquired a good title from F2. What's this no. good title business? What are you talking? We haven't done that yet. Yeah, but good. I mean, it's actually a very complicated term, so I appreciate using it. But the question is, if F3 buys it from F2, okay? F3 buys it from F2, right? And then F3, I'm sorry, F1 to F3. Does the answer change if you bought it? No, it shouldn't. But that's because there's some... Um, in the notes, there's reference to that when you acquire from somebody who stole it, then you're actually now getting title from that, the, the person who did Okay, so the short answer is this you'll study, um, you'll we'll say this next semester, or actually this semester, semester. But there's a concept, there's a concept where some buy it's not noticed that it was stolen. You actually have protection. protection. And what ends up happening is, and this only because you asked, if F3 sues F1, what happens is F3 will basically implead F2, if you remember from Civ Pro. Remember that? At F3 will say, okay, F2, you sold me this Roger thing. You can indemnify me. You can back me up. So that's what actually would happen. So F3 would not be on the hook if he was actually purchasing it rather than stealing it. We'll do that uh, later this semester a little bit, but that's a preview. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Uh, yes, that's uh, Jamie. Or we'll to go down the chimney, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> it's assuming that F2 steals whatever from F1 and... Uh, oh, so say one more time, I think I missed what you just said. If F2, if F2 steals it from F1. Yes, sir. And then the F3 again steals it from F2. Yeah. Um, so F1 obviously can win the claim with F3, but can F1 still sue F2 for any of the time that he had stolen it or deprived him of his property? Or anything? No, and the reason why is that F2 and F3 aren't in privity. Right? When you steal something from someone, they don't have any kind of relationship. So F1 would not be able to sue F2 for that action. I, I, I suppose F, F, I mean, F1 could sue F2 for a trespass, but they can't get the value of the actual item because it doesn't have it anymore. Okay, I just wondered like, if he just pretty much gets a Yeah, I mean, if you, if you break into your house and steal something, you can sue for a trespass, but that's totally separate from the value of the item, whether you can recover it. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one other concept the book mentions, and I want to discuss it uh, uh, briefly, which is the idea of a bailment, um, which is a term that uh, uh, you probably never thought of anymore, except you've probably all heard of bail. If you ever drive downtown by the courthouse, every billboard is for bail bonds and bail bonds, right? Uh, 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 you know, they always compete for the most outrageous ads. Um, but you've all done bailment. Right? If you've ever brought your car to a valet, which in Houston is impossible not to, uh, because everyone has parking lots with valet attendants, which drives me crazy, um, you give your cars to the guy, he parks your car. Um, if you've ever seen Ferris Bueller or whatever, you know, you always worry that someone will take your valet and then drive it around wherever it goes. 
Generally speaking, though, under the common law, when you give your property to someone, they have a duty to manage it in a responsible fashion. Another example is a dry cleaner or a laundromat. If you ever bring your clothes to get you know, cleaned, they have a duty to protect it. Now, if you ever read the ticket on your valet, or if you ever read the ticket on your dry cleaner, it says, we assume no liability, all the yada, 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 right? But that's all a matter of modern custom. Under the common law, the common law uh, uh, imposes a duty for them to protect your stuff. That little waiver at the bottom attempts to ignore the common law um, uh, duty. So where does it interact with our doctrine? Um, for certain found goods, right? If you find an item, you're actually cons considered a belly. Okay, actually, uh, uh, let me give you this, this, this tip. There are two parties to think about, the bailor and the bailee. And if you notice, they're identical except for the last two letters. You'll see this a lot in property. Okay? There's uh, a grantor, grantee, transferor, transferee. And most law students, and myself included, um, become very confused about who is who. And what you have to remember in a property transaction is in every transaction, one person is giving something and the other person's receiving something. I am granting you property, you are receiving the property. It's always a two party deal. Okay? The trick is, and this is how you can remember, the suffix or is a person giving, and the suffix e is receiving. So the grantor is the person giving, the grantee is the person receiving. The bailor is the person giving the item, the bailee is receiving it. And the way you can remember this, and this I learned from Bar Review years ago, think of like me, right, you're giving it to me, that's the person receiving it. And then the other one is one giving it. Um, I know this sounds stupid, but we will have cases here where you're not gonna remember who is who. Um, remember this trick, me, and it'll be very easy. Because uh, this comes up all in property one and property two. Everyone get that? So the bad lawyer is the person giving the property, okay, and then the belly is the person receiving or actually holding the property. Okay. Uh, yes, is that uh, Samantha? Yeah. Ah, ah. So the book actually a distinction. There's something called a voluntary. Bailey, which is like the valet or the the the, uh, the uh, dry cleaners, and then there's the involuntary belly, which is basically a finder, right? This is where if I find a jewel on my on the floor, I take my possession, say I'm going to hold this for the original person, and that actually imposes the duty of care, right? And generally speaking, you get a reward out of it, I suppose. Uh, but the law does not compel that. Okay. Don't worry too much about the bailment. <laughs> right, any questions on that? Uh, yes, hold on. That's, uh, is that Madison? Yeah. So in the case where the janitor found the money from someone mm -hmm. and The janitor found money just lying in the hotel room. Yeah. I think he'd be a thief. Uh, but but I mean, so so we'll get to this distinction between lost and mislaid property later, right? But let me ask you this question, Madison. If you're in a hotel room, right, and there's a twenty dollar bill sitting in the dresser, you know, you know, right right next to the person's keys, right, and the person was saying the pool, you know, swimming, was that property abandoned? Was it lost or mislaid? Okay, so part of this is also you have to understand is this property actually abandoned? Now, what if you're walking down the street and you see a twenty dollar bill, you know, in in the in the drain just fluttering around in the on the gutter? <laughs> okay, so I think the janitor who finds a twenty dollar bill on the dresser in the hotel room next to the keys is probably a thief, but um, you know that's part of the analysis. The book also has one other interesting case involving uh, two criminals. So imagine this. Person one trespasses onto a, onto a forest and he cuts down all the trees. And then person two steals the trees that were cut down. So in a case of dueling chutzpah, right, 
the person said, person one says, look, I have a stronger claim to these trees because I cut them down. And this person says, no, oh, you know, I had it last. And the court rules that the thief who trespassed and cut down the trees has a stronger claim than the thief who stole them second. So this idea of finder, you know, first in time prevails. Okay. All right, so any questions in the basics? It gets more complicated after we do the, um, the Hannah versus Peel case. Everyone get the basics at least so far. And this poor guy is stuck in there. Yeah, it's find that picture somewhere. I was trying to find a, one that wasn't too grotesque. All right. So, um, all right, let's go to Hannah v. Peel. So the facts of Hannah v. Peel, um, is it Zachary? Yeah. The facts of Hannah v. Peel are pretty straightforward. What happened here? Good. Good. Yeah. By the way, the Third Amendment doesn't apply in England. We we you know, we we uh we fought a war for that. That we no no quartering of troops. Although during times of war, troops can be quartered, but Congress has to pay for it. That's the distinction. So go ahead, Zachary. So it was a house was requisitioned for soldiers. Appeal never made it there. And what happened? Anna was one of the soldiers there, and when they all yeah, right. He got a hold of something and he didn't think he got it. I think they said he got it. It ended up being a brooch. What's a brooch? Yeah, it's like a jewel. Yeah, it's all decked. This thing wasn't worth a lot of money either, was it? <coughs> okay, so what happened after um, Zachary, after he found his brooch? He said he like, dropped it outside the window and uh -huh. the next day he tore it on the ground. He picked it up and he talked about it. Oh, they were selling it. Mm -hmm. And Bill found out about that. He was like, oh, no, it's mine. He found it in my house. Yeah. Okay, so here we have a case where um, Hannah seems like an upstanding gentleman, right? He's, he's serving in the war. He finds this jewel. Um, he calls the police. You know, he, he gives it to the cops. And then, you know, after, I think, what, two years, no one claims the brooch. So the police call, not Hannah but they call Peel, who is the owner of the home. Peel then promptly sells it and gets, you know, not like, was it 66 pounds? Not, not a significant amount of money we're talking about. And then Hannah sues. Now, I just want to dwell here for a second. During the period of 1938 through 1943, Europe was busy. <laughs> there was a world war raging. I don't know who the hell these soldiers are that they're suing over a, a stupid brooch while there's a blitz going on. I, I, I can't fathom who these people are. Uh, but, you know, it's good that courts are operating. I guess they have their own priorities, uh, 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 whatever. But it's good to know that during the middle of the blitz that the courts are still functioning. Anyway, so the court here is faced with a very difficult task. What makes this task difficult, and I think this was someone's question a few minutes ago, is that the case law evolved in a very erratic manner. So before I ask you, what's the holding of Hannah B. Peel? That's actually much down the line. I want to walk through each of the cases in order that the court discusses. And I'm going to uh, uh, write them up here to try and figure out what are the various tests that we have. Okay? So the first case, right? <coughs> The first case, of course, is Armory. We just did a minute ago. So, uh, Catherine, what was the what was the holding of Armory? We, we just did this two minutes ago. Step. Okay, very good, right? The yeah, basically finders keepers. Yeah, I like to phrase it. Except the original owner has superior claim. Okay. That's that's the rule from the case we just did. Now, Catherine, does that rule help us much in this case? Uh, I guess it can. Under this rule, who would win? Ah, and really, Hannah and Armory in the same position, right? They were working in some building that wasn't theirs. They found some jewel, found, right? And they kept it. Right? So um, let's go back up to Jackie. Jackie, if the rule is finder's keeper of Armory, why, why didn't they just give the judgment to the to the finder, to, to Hannah. I mean, Peel never got it until the cops gave it to him. Right? Why Why did not this resolve the case very quickly? Peel said it was in his house. Ah. 
We have this new wrinkle, right? In Armory, we didn't have the owner of the home showing up. We did not have the owner of the home showing up. The other defendant was a jeweler. But in this case, in contrast, right? In this case, in contrast, the owner of the home shows up. So then uh, Jackie's exactly right. The owner says, hey, wait a minute, right? This is my property. And if you recall, we had a doctrine called ratio solis, right? If you have to, that there's a wild animal in your property, it becomes yours. He's like, look, this is on my land, so it's mine. <laughs> so the court then has to walk through a series of precedents, which they basically say the law is unsettled. So the first case they mention, Bridge versus Hawksworth. I love these British names. 18, I think I spelled that wrong. Oh, Hawksworth. Whatever, close enough. Bridges versus Hawksworth. I actually once got an evaluation saying I made too many typos in my lecture notes, so I uh, hope you will. Hope. Okay. I'll, then, and the little red squiggly lines there for lazy students who can't tell. But yeah, it's, it's you know, thank you, Google. I'll try, I'll try, I'll spell check later. So, um, uh, Ross, what was, the, what was the issue then in, 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 in uh, Bridges versus Hawksworth? Money, right? Banknotes for money, yeah. Okay, so a guy finds some banknotes, right? Some money. Where does he find them? Okay, so you're right, but that wasn't necessarily what happened. The court made it seem as if the money was found inside the store, but the actual parties didn't litigate on that point. The record was actually silent about where the banknotes were found. But we'll pretend, I mean, you're right. The banknotes were found inside the store. So Ross, what happened with these banknotes found in the store? Well, no. What happened first? How, how did the how did the how did the plaintiff and the defendant try and work it out originally amongst the two of them? No, no, not not here. Alyssa. Who held on to the money in the initial instance, Alyssa? Yeah, the shopkeeper, right. And how did they attempt to return it to the original owner? How would the original owner find out? Yeah, you advertise, right? So they put an advertisement in the newspaper and said, hey, if you lost you know, this amount of money in this area, come claim it, right? No one showed up. Right? No one showed up. So, Tim, what happened after no one came and showed up and, and, and uh, claimed the advertising? <laughs> I'm sorry? The shopkeeper kept it. Do you think the shopkeeper kept it separate for three years and never touched it, put it like in a box, like a lockbox, right? He used it, right? Yeah. I, I, think, I think Tim's probably right. Uh, uh, over, the, over those three years, the shopkeeper, no doubt, spent it. He didn't have it anymore. It was gone. So the court in this case is, okay, so first of all, we have armory. And Brian, if we resolve this based purely on armory, who wins? If it's just based purely on armory, who wins this case? No, no, no. I'm talking about bridges. We're talking about bridges. I know. This case confuses students every year without fail. In bridges, the facts we've discussed <laughs> that, 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 that uh, Alyssa and um, Ross mentioned, if we apply armory, who wins? What was the rule in Armory? Okay, so who, who would win this case? Bridges. Why? Yes, he's a finder. It's not that hard. You're thinking way too hard, right? If we apply the rule of Armory, the finder wins. Armory was entirely silent on the question of who owns a property. It said nothing about ownership, right? But one of the elements of the common law is that doctrines devolve, devolve, Freudian slip, evolve. That's an inadvertent, but it worked. 
They evolve and develop. How did the doctrine then develop, Matthew, in this case? What did, what did the court do in this case to um, tweak armory? Yeah, so how did they how did they tweak the rule of armory? Just a little bit. Yeah. Right. So Okay. So the court put weight on the fact that the money was found in the shop. Okay? The court put weight on the fact that the money was 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 in the shop. Okay. So here comes the tricky part, and this isn't clear for me the case from the first time, uh, Mary. What difference does it make in this case whether the money was found in a shop that was owned by someone? Why would that make a difference here? Ah, so is this actually a private place? Okay, Mary's exactly right. Okay, she's exactly right. This was a public place. So it's still finders keepers, except for original owner. Okay, everyone see that? The court said, had this been a private place, the shopkeep would have had it. But because there's a place to be frequented and traffic by anyone walking in and out of the street, it's still the rule of finders keepers. But this introduces a new element. Because what happens in the next case if it is, in fact, a private property? Then armor won't apply. So see what happened here, right? They, they, they adjusted the common law rule without any rationale, but they did it. And the, um, the, 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 the Hannah Appeal Court said this was, quote, subject to immense disputation. This is a judge saying it was wrong, right? There was nothing in the record about whether they were found in the shop. There was no way about the location it was material. But the court then relied on this to rule in the fashion it did. Everyone with me so far? Any questions? So you see how the doctrine's developing. You have the armory case, which is at finders keepers. You have Bridges says because it's a public place, then it's finders keepers. But had it been private, I'll put it like this, if private, then the owner of property wins, right? That's how, that's the implication. The court didn't hold that, but that's the implication that we have here. Okay. So, uh, yes, hold on. That's Thomas? Yeah. So private property, the, the owner wins, but the original owner of the item is still wins. Always. The, the original owner always wins. Always. But in these cases, it's very rare that the original owner shows up because that makes it too easy. All right, so Justin, let's go to the next case. Another another wonderful British name. South Stafford oh my God. South Staffordshire Water Company versus Sh Charmin. I, I don't I spelled it wrong, don't tell me. South Staffordshire Water Com oh, Company versus Charmin. Okay. So uh, um, Justin, what, what were the facts there? Yeah, they were cleaning out a lake, right? They are basically cleaning out a pond. Uh-huh. Okay. So thank you, Justin. That's exactly right. So here we have the case. This is purely private property, right? The lake is private property. Um, Kevin, were the water company people, were they allowed to enter the property at their own pleasure? How come they were allowed to enter onto the property? They were hired, right? In other words, they were only allowed onto the property for the purposes for which they were hired. What was that purpose? To clean out the pool. Exactly right. 
So what the court basically says here, right, is that this, uh, sorry, these workers will only allow there for specific purpose. Okay, and so citing Bridgesworth, I'm sorry, Bridgeworth, citing Hawksworth, the court says that the possession of land entitles possession of everything attached to it. In the absence of better title. There are those typos people complain about. Right? The fact is the rings were actually in the dirt. They were in the mud at the bottom of this pool. They were literally they were literally attached to the property. So the owner of the property has superior claim against everyone unless they have a better title, unless it's the original owner. So what happened here in Hawks in, in, in Staffordshire was they basically built onto Hawksworth. Hawksworth raised the idea that private property wins, and then Sharman applied it in the next case over. Okay? And this is true even if the owner of the property is not aware of them. He never knew these rings were there. He had no idea, right? But the court extended this doctrine, right? That the possession of land gives you control over what's on it. Okay? Everyone understand here? So you see how the common law works, right? You have one case that starts out very simple. You have a second case that puts a random twist to it. And then you have a third case which applies that twist. Even if step two, case two, was wrong, step three continues to apply it. Okay? Why? Because they were bound by it. They were bound by the prior precedent that to follow it, even though it probably was wrong. All right, so any questions on, on the water case, the lake case? Um, yes, Jamie. Didn't you say also something about um, because the workers were there and on the, the direction of the property owner, they're basically representing the property owner? How is it any different than the chimney sweep hired to clean the chimney? It's not. You see the point, right? The chimney sweep was in the exact same fashion. He was hired to clean the chimney. The soldier was hired to be a soldier, right? He was there in the course of his duties, right? He was, he was, that wasn't his property. He was only there to, to be a soldier. In that case, could you argue though, that he wasn't actually there as a homeowner? I think he was, might have actually been an officer underneath that guy, but, but, but yeah, I mean, you can make that argument. But the general idea is it didn't matter that he was only there for limited purposes. The next case, though, makes it much more clear, right? The next case, um, Sarah, this case of Yules uh, versus Brig gas. Uh, uh, Sarah, what were the facts there? Uh, I'm sorry? Me or the other Sarah. Oh, in, in order, that one. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess you're in the same line of sight also. Okay, go ahead. So Okay, for what purpose? Okay, so I asked this question before. I'll ask it again to you, Sarah. If someone has a lease for gas and minerals, what are they allowed to take from the ground? Easy, right? Are they allowed to take other stuff? That's right. So, I mean, this is a, this is a very common example in Texas more than other states. You can keep the surface rights, right? You can keep the ability to keep your house on top of the land and your farm, whatever else, but you can sell the subsurface rights to let people dig for oil or to dig for minerals or to dig for natural gas. The lease in this question only extended to oil and gas and minerals. Okay? So, Sarah, what did they discover on this land? Is a boat oil or gas? Okay. So does the lease include the right for them to have access to the boat? Okay. So that's the, that's the easy way of explaining the case, okay? The, the, the boat belonged to the plaintiff because he actually owned the property, okay? It was literally attached to the ground, like the rings that was buried in the rings, right? So this is basically the same thing, uh, possession of land uh, entitles ownership, uh, owners, no. possession of land entitles possession of everything attached. This is, this is more or less the same rule as Charmin. Okay. Same rule. Questions on, on the on the Yule's case? 
All right. So then, um, Hunter, yeah. so we have this case now. We have this case where we have um, this brooch. And this brooch is found in the property owned by Peel. Following the precedence of Yules and Charmin and Bridges, how ought this case to turn out? The owner of the house gets to keep it. What happened? Why does a court rule for the finder when you have these three cases which all seem to say that the location of the property prevails, that the owner of the property prevails? Where did they get that from? Was that in any of these cases? Ah, the, Richard? No, no. You Richard? Richard? Yeah. Richard, let me ask you this question. How does the court rule in favor of the finder when the cases seem so clearly to suggest that the owner of the property prevails? Because they say the Ah, so that the ring wasn't like bolted to the to the window? The brooch wasn't bolted? So, so I mean, because he didn't dig it up from the earth, it was sitting on a windowsill covered by cobwebs that wasn't part of the property? Is that, is that it? What do you think, Brenda? Yeah, I, I, th I, th I think, Brenda, I think that's right. If you couldn't tell, the majority opinion doesn't like these precedents, right? They think all these precedents from 200 years ago were wrong. Or actually 100 years ago were wrong. So what do they say? The brooch was lost. The plaintiff <laughs> gave it to the police. He was commendable for doing so. The defendant was never in possession. The defendant had no knowledge of it. The plaintiff found it. Judgment for the plaintiff. Reward the finder. <clears throat> Even though they cite bridges, right? They cite bridges. <laughs> and bridges says if it's public property, the finder keeps it. This was not public property. So this case, I'll get to second, Cody. This case, I think, is best understood as basically saying all those other cases were wrong. So let's make the law even more complicated, right? Let's issue a rule with no analysis. Like the last paragraph or two, they just threw that out there. There wasn't really much there. Yeah, I mean, it probably drove you nuts reading it. I was going to say, did, did maybe the fact that you brought the police have anything to do with the woman? Because I feel like... Is that anywhere in the case law? Is that like if you're a good person, you get a better claim to no, it? No, it wasn't because he's a good person, but the idea that if, if no one claims it, then it's them, <laughs> like they don't mention it, but I mean, that they brought up for some reason that he brought them to the police. I think they say they thought it was commendable because they were trying to reward him for being a good guy. Yeah, I mean, may maybe you're right, but I, I think it was more they're trying to say the equities tilt in favor of the finder here. And then the defendant is basically this jerk who never claimed to it, never went to the house. He has no, he has, you know, no right to it. So, again, the holding of this case is unhelpful. The holding of this case is unhelpful. But what I'd like you to know is the four or five cases that preceded it and how the doctrine evolved. The next case, we'll see how it gets even more complicated. Um, Someone's going to ask me, which is the rule? Um, they, they all are. Um, if you look at my old exams, right, you'll see different factors. So maybe in one, one year I'll ask, but something was actually, you know, in the dirt. You know, it's in the dirt. Another thing was something sitting on top of something. Another person was in a public park, right? You have to figure out which test is close to what I'm asking about. Uh, 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 Jonathan. So if we get a question where you find I, I got your question. I got you one ahead of time. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, if you get a question about private property and finding an item, the analysis, do we have to mention this case or like just randomly rule against you? Yeah. You yeah, I, I think you mentioned the cases that work for you. So, I mean, often what I'll ask on the exam is, what's the strongest argument in favor of X? And something like that is you'd cite the case that, 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 that supports it. But again, I wouldn't cite Hannah by itself or much because the, the, <laughs> the analysis is basically we don't like this guy, Peel. I mean, there's, I mean, I'm trying to be charitable. There's really not that much analysis there. They just don't like these cases, and they go back to armoring <laughs> and disregarding all, all things that came between. All right, any other questions on Hannah?
more important than had are the cases that it cites. That's why I actually took the time to list them on the on the board. There is no majority, and we're back to the McAvoy case, making it more complicated. So hold, hold your hold your question about the majority opinion. This is why this topic is so simple, like what ten pages of reading, but it's it's annoyingly complicated. Um, so what were the facts in Erica in uh, McAvoy versus Medina? Good. Okay, it, it was on the table, right? So let me stop you right there. If you see a, a pocketbook or a wallet, right, sitting on the table, what's your first thought about how it got there? Was it placed there to abandon it, or was it accidentally forgot there? Or what's what's your thinking? Yeah, how many people, whenever they went to, you know, uh, pay for something, they actually left the credit card at the counter just like for a minute, so you take it out for that wallet, whatever, right? So the fact is, uh, uh, I think Erica's right. The money was on the table. Now, Erica, let me ask you a different question. What if the wallet was on the floor, right? It was just sitting there on the floor underneath the table. What would your thought be there? They dropped it, yeah. They dropped it, okay? There's a difference in the law between um, uh, abandoned property and mislaid property, right? If it's something that you put down the counter when you're paying, and you forget it's there. We say it's mislaid. Okay, um, Julia. Say I was going to pay for something, and I put my wallet on the table, taking out my bills, and I paid for it, and I got distracted, and I walked away. At some point, I'll realize the money's missing, right? What's the first place I'll go to look? At the register. But wait a minute, I paid for my haircut. I you know I took cash out, but then I lost it, right? So in that case, it, it makes sense that you leave it with the property owner because that's the first place you'll look. But what if you know, you're walking around town all day, Jessica, right? And you lose your wallet and you have no idea where you were and the wallet was lost. What are you going to do? <coughs> yeah, I mean, this is 18 There's no credit cards yet. Yeah. There's, there's no locate my iPhone feature, right? Yeah, but it's more complicated. You don't know exactly where to walk. <coughs> Right, you, you're walking all over town. You know there 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 are streets. You could be in a corner, wherever it is. So this case, this case tries to illustrate that. So you have a guy who leaves some money on the on the counter, and he describes a transient customer. What's a transient customer? He was from out of town. He's not going to come back. So for all intents and purposes, the original owner's gone. Right? There, there, there's not going to happen. So the uh, uh, a defendant held on to it. The plaintiff at some point said, hey, give me the money, and then the defendant said, no. Okay, so um, Veronica, under, under Armory, right, let's go all the way back to Armory. How would this case come out? The very first case we did, Armory. Finders keepers, right? Veronica, under Bridges versus Hawksworth, right, how would this case come out, the second case we did? What kind of business is a barber shop? Mm. What kind of business is a barber shop? Was this like a private property, like a pool? Oh. What was the shop like in, in, in Hawksworth? Was it a public shop? What, no. So how would we view the barber shop? Yeah. So so again, here we have a situation where we have a barber shop. People are allowed to come and go, walk in and out. It's not like private property. So had we just straight up applied bridges, then the answer would be the same. This is public property, and the finder keeps it. Right? Everyone understand, if you just straight up applied bridges versus Hawksworth, it's the same case. Money's found in a shop, and you keep it. But uh, JL, they don't, they don't apply Preston straight up. What do they do that's new? They add a new wrinkle. Um, What's this? Good. Um, yeah. So why are they making this case even more complicated? You asked me a minute ago, what's the majority rule? Why can't they just let dogs lie and just apply a case? Why do they keep adding a new wrinkle to it? <laughs> it, it, it gives better interpretation to different scenarios. So if you're, if you're allowed to look at different cases, and if, if there's no rightful owner, it's abandoned, and you look at the um, finder's keepers, but if it does 
cover right for someone else to come back and it should be there for the person Yeah, I, th I think that's a good explanation, right? They're developing the common law. They're trying to develop the common law to fit these different situations. You know, we're not those British people, right? We were Tennessee. We have our own court system. We can make up our own law. So even under bridges, the answer is actually fairly simple. The plaintiff, the finder, gets it. But here they say, look, this, this money wasn't abandoned. It wasn't like on the floor. It wasn't thrown away. Some guy was paying for his bill and left the money on the counter, left on the table. Right? It was, it was mislaid and not, not lost. It was mislaid and not lost. And because it was mislaid, the better rule is let the owner keep it. Why? Because he's most likely in the position to give it back to the person who lost it. If you mislaid your money, it's like, oh, man, you know, I paid for my haircut. I forgot my wallet. Let me go back to the barber. They're making an efficiency argument. Okay? Is that chair still broken? Wow. Yeah. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> so the argument is effectively that the uh, owner of the shop is in the better position. So they add, they add a, a, a yet another wrinkle. Right? So, in McAvoy, uh, the, the rule is basically mislaid property uh, 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 it, it goes to the owner of the uh, shop, right? Mislaid property goes to the owner of the shop, not the finder. Again, mislaid means you just place for access, but to abandon the loss. So that only that's uh, that's Josh, yeah. Uh, public spaces that right? Well, if you notice, the court doesn't really base upon that, and I left that deliberately open. The court doesn't actually attack whether it's public property, public or private. If I had to guess if it's private property, it'd be a different story. But a shop is what's called a common carrier, as you probably know. There has to be open to all customers, so it's not it can't exclude people. So it's not really private in that sense of the word. They don't say it which is what makes this complicated doctrine so annoying. So let's try to, you know, because I know if someone asks me this in two minutes, let's try to, you know, run through a summary of all these various rules. And I wrote them up here. Um, I usually don't do this, right? Throughout all the cases, the rule is always that the original owner prevails. I don't care which case you're talking about, the original owner prevails, right? That, 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 that principle carries through to all of them. Okay. Another principle that carries through through most of them, not all of them, but most of them, is that if it's on private property, the owner of the private property prevails. That doesn't apply to all of them. And then the last case, the McAvoy adds the principle that if the property is mislaid, it goes to the owner of the property. Whereas if it's abandoned, it goes to the finder. These are all different rules which are inconsistent. So my recommendation for you, and this is something you'll see by looking at my past exams, is try to figure out what the facts are in this case, right? If the facts involve something about losing or mislaying property, you can know which rule to apply. If the facts involve a piece of you know jewelry embedded in the dirt, you probably know which facts to apply. Um, but if you're frustrated that there's not one single rule, welcome to property law. Because if you're ever confronted with a case like this in your lives, there won't be a single rule. There, there's actually very conflicting precedents on this point. And the common law in the states is just as just as jumbled. It's not, you know, there again, there's no restatement of lost property, right? There's no there's no UCC for found objects. That doesn't exist. So you have to know all these common law principles. <coughs> Questions? I think your hand was up a minute ago. You said if the property is mislaid, it goes to the owner of the property. You mean the owner of the property where the property is found? Yes. Cody? Whenever this, these actions are occurring, is the court always sitting in equity with the past uh, I don't think these are equitable actions because they're basically actions for recovery of the value of the item. So it's not really an equitable action. Uh, yeah, Jamie. Um, in the case where we're going to say the finder wins, the owner has a strong disclaimer of all 
is there a time let's say like in case of money for that that was a question that uh, that Langdon asked uh, Langdon asked a few minutes ago right what happens if how long do you have to sit on it before you abandon your claim and under this doctrine called adverse possession in most states if you know someone has your property for 10 years and you do nothing to stop them you actually lose it the 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 the, the number varies by states but at least in Texas it's a 10 year window Yes, sir. That's hold on. That's uh, Adam. Yeah. So taking the McAvoy fact matter and pushing the efficiency argument aside for a second, if it's private property and then it's unattached yeah. because it was just left, yeah. Is it so taking the rule from Hannah? Property owner I think you could you could make that argument. It, it, so the question was, if it's private property, it's not, not attached. Would the rule of Hannah apply? You can make the argument, yeah. Because of Hannah, the guy was in the or something. Yeah, they made the distinction that it wasn't physically bolted to the, you know, it wasn't yeah. part of the property, which is some. It's a silly distinction if you think about it. I mean, technically speaking, it was covered by cobwebs. I think that that's actually part of the, you know, it, it was it was covered just like dirt would. Yeah, uh, who else? Anyone else? Uh, go back to Cody in a second. <coughs> yeah, Cody? I'll wait till later. Anyone else? Cody, go ahead. Okay, so there's cases where people like buy a house and in the barn there's like 30 cars that are worth millions of dollars. Right? That's happened. They've happened like a couple years ago in England. And I was wondering. They, they buy a house with cars in the garage? They buy a house and there's just cars in the barn that was locked. They didn't know, they know the, the, the no cars were in there? It was. Because presumably those, well, those people did keep those cars because they own the property now. Right. But if someone else just like walked in and saw these cars and said, <coughs> it seems like no different than the brooch in the Hannah case, right? Because it's just property that they didn't know they actually own. Yeah. I mean, I suppose if they, I mean, a better example is if you buy a piece of property, and you know, you're digging a pool one day and you discover some buried treasure in the backyard, right? You didn't know it was there. Who gets the claim to it? Um, uh, this actually happens once in a while. People find jewelry. There was actually a case a year or two ago where someone was cleaning out a pool and they found a class ring from like 50 years ago and they actually were able to track down the person based on the class ring inscription, which, which is kind of interesting. But, you know, these, these cases do happen. All right. Questions? Yes, uh, Jessica. I didn't understand very well why you said that we – I know it's like that agent principle did not apply in the chimney future. Why do we just kind of make it apply? We don't have to worry about that. Did the court in Armory make any fact that the uh, that the person was working for the original owner? Was that even mentioned? No. Okay. But what about the fact? Okay, so okay, let me explain it this way. Her question was, why did it not matter in Armory? I'm sorry. Why did it matter in the gas case that they were working for the? I'm sorry, the the water case that they were working for the uh, company, right? Yeah, why do we, we don't have to worry about that agent principle? I, I, I don't think it matters much because under the terms of their lease, they were only able to go for oil and gas. And under the terms of the um, uh, the water case, they're only there to dig the pool. That's the only purpose for them to be there. They weren't there to go treasure hunting. So if you don't hear back, uh, oh, wait a second. If you don't hear back by Thursday for the exam solved, please contact me. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to talk to them today. Uh, there's one more question. Yeah. Absolutely, and that, that was the court didn't even didn't even address that. Perhaps the difference is because the person who employed him wasn't a party in the case. That would be one reason why they wouldn't bother doing that. The jeweler had no interest in the agency relationship. Okay, I will see all of you uh, next week. Thank you.